thank you everybody for your patience. <laughs> so I'm gonna start now. So I'm uh, Giovanna, Giovanna Ambrosini from Philips Booker Group. We are a group at EPFL, a computational uh, biology group. Uh, we are focusing that focuses on the analysis of genome sequencing data as well as the development of uh, web-based uh, web -based tool, tools and databases basically related to genome structure and, trans and transcriptional regulation. So today I will show you a few principles of CHIP-seq data analysis which I will explain via a guided sort of guided to a step-by-step -step tutorial uh, through our uh, two main uh, web platforms, the ChIP-Seq uh, server and uh, for ChIP-Seq data analysis and the signal search analysis or SSA platform for motif analysis. So the goal, uh, our goal is to get you acquainted with our tools, of course, and we would like to encourage you to use this platform because we think it's quite easily easy to use and it's in particular very useful for data exploration exploitation uh, as you can run quite even complex pipeline quite rapidly and in an in interactive manner uh, as you will see in a while so about this workshop uh, so today i will start uh, i will basically focus on some common biological questions for chip seek data analysis and for each task i'll try to expose the biological motivations explain the underlying methods uh, and provide step-by-step -step instruction and guidelines for the interpretation of the results so this is what I call by tutorial style presentation. We will uh, basically work with two bioinformatic, as I previously said, the bioinformatic resources from our group, the ChIP-Seq analysis server, whose link you see it here. I also encourage you to go to the web uh, server and the signal search analysis for motif analysis, so, uh, which you find the URL here. If you want to go more in depth uh, with our tools, explore more, we have more worker workshop material here this, uh, on this link. So today's example is based on an early landmark experiment about 10 years ago that was targeted at STAT1 in Gila cell. If, as probably most of you know, STAT1 in, in response to cytokines and growth factors translocate to the cell nucleus where it acts as a, a, transcription, a transcription activator. So uh, this experiment, this IP experiment, is compo uh, includes two, two types of, two type of data. Uh, IP data from interferon gamma stimulated HeLa cells, which is the main experiment, and the control data, the unstimulated HeLa cell control data. We will be using the main experiment. We will not use the control data in our uh, tutorial today. So this data comprises about 15 million uh, sequence reads that have been mapped to the, to the human genome. This is a typical size of a ChIP-seq data set, a ChIP-seq experiment, especially at that time. Today's ChIP-seq data sets reach uh, even 20, 30 million sequence reads. Before starting, I would like to show you this figure that gives you a nice summary of the state-of-the-art technologies for chromatin studies. So, in general terms, a genomic locus can be analyzed by complementary chromatin profiling experiments that reveal different aspects of chromatin structure. So, as you know, ChIP-seq reveals binding sites of specific transcription factors, DNA-seq, ATAC-seq, and PER, which are similar uh, techniques, reveal regions of open chromatin, and MNA-seq, identifies well-positioned nucleosomes. So, of course, each technique uh, implies a particular kind of data representation that is specific to the technique itself. Our tools have been designed to 
cope with different, uh, different varieties of data. And this is the, one of the main uh, guiding principles of our tools. So this is, a, here I show a schematic view of, uh, the, of the process, the ChIP-seq process that leads to the input data for our analysis. As you know, the ChIP-seq process enriches for specific cross-linked DNA protein complexes using an antibody against the protein of interest after size selection. All the resulting ChIP DNA fragments are sequenced simultaneously by using the genome sequencer. The sequence file that we get back, uh, basically a FASTQ file, needs to be aligned to a reference genome. And subsequently, uh, subsequently, areas of protein DNA binding are identified by, by peak calling. So our tool uh, deal with the uh, already map read alignment data, basically. Here I show you multiple fragments coming bound by the same protein and coming originating from the same chromosomal location as it is depicted here. The short sequence reads are mapped are mapped to the genome, which are these uh, uh, short sequences uh, highlighted by these arrows, green and red arrows. There's, given the double-stranded nature of DNA, as, already, as uh, Eric already mentioned yesterday, the reads representing one binding site, basically this, will map on the plus and the minus strand, respectively. So this leads to a kind of read alignment histogram for both strands of the chromosome, as we see here by these uh, green and red dots. Note that reads that map on the plus and minus strands accumulate upstream and downstream of the protein bound complex, respect. So here we have a view of such redistribution alignment on DNA. We, we see this, uh, this on a specific STAT1 locus at the UCSC genome browsers. I suppose most of you know the UCSC genome browsers. This is one, the, the, this locus represents the promoter region of a, of a, uh, of a known uh, STAT1 target gene, ICAM1. And so this is the promoter region. We see the plus strand reads in green and the distribution and the minus strand uh, reads in, in red here. So how do we represent this type of uh, read uh, alignment data? We use a simple format that we call uh, SGA. It stands for simple genome annotation. SGA is a bed-like format, as you will see. It's a, <clears throat> it, it is a tab-delimited text file which has uh, five obligatory fields, a sequence identifier that uniquely identifies the, the genome assembly and the species, species and genome assemblies. For that, we chose to use NCBI RefSec, data, uh, refsec identifiers so to avoid mix-ups between different species and genome assemblies. Then we have a feature field, which is a short string that identifies the experiment, describes the experiment, the position of the read, the strand, and then counts, counts being the number of reads that have been mapped to this particular position. So one important feature of this uh, SGA format is that for computational uh, efficiency, eh? uh, SGA needs to be sorted by chromosome identifier, by sequence identifier, position and strength. And this is because our program really can, um, can process entire genomes in less, uh, in less than a minute. So for a bit more of technicality, this is a difference, a few differences, the main differences between SGA and BAT format. So here on top, we have two SGA, SGA lines and the bed lines here. As I said uh, before, SGA is a single position format. We only represent the five prime end of the fragments of the uh, short sequence reads, whereas bed indicates region. So you have a start and end coordinates as it is shown here. 
So the bed coordinates, keep in mind, uh, that are zero-based, whereas SGA are one-based coordinates. This means that for coordinates on the plus strand, when we tra uh, translate them to SGA, we have to add one core, uh, one one-based pairs, as it is shown here. Whereas on the minus strand, those, so this is a fragment on the minus strand, we represent the five prime and on the minus. So this is the green coordinate. In that case, on the minus strand, we keep the coordinate as it is. As I said before, SGA files are required to be sorted by chromosome position and strength, chromosome identifier position and strength, and both files are tab delimited formats. So which, which are the questions that basically we ask when we interrogate the chip -seq data? Of course, we want to find, we want to map binding sites genome-wide. This is <laughs> the main goal. We also want generally to find, to benchmark these files, to characterize them. And so we use motif enrichment to find whether these peaks are enriched in particular in a set of binding sites or a specific binding sites, depending on the binding mode of our protein, of our transcription factor, and this is an important step. We also uh, want to study the chromatin context of our peak regions, of our regions where the chromatin, so see whether, and we use that by histone modification profiles, by comparing, correlating histone modification profiles around our regions uh, in, of interest, IP regions. And of course, uh, we also want to generally see whether these uh, genome, uh, genomic regions fall in, conser uh, in conserved uh, regions across the genome because this may reveal important biological functions of our, of our uh, protein of interest. So the chip server the chip, uh, is a front-end to the ChIP-seq tools, to tools uh, behind the web interface, which is basically a collection of C programs and a few Perl scripts that have been designed, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, with a few principles in mind. Uh, the tools are simple tools, are very easy to understand, even to non-specialists, and they perform very basic tasks, uh, as we will see. I will describe a few of them in, the, in details today. They are fast algorithms, as I said, and, gene and they implement generic methods in order not to be restricted, as I said, to ChIP-seq data. The web interface has a modular design as well, in that the output of one task can be used as the input by the next task. We will see that in a while. And uh, so we can, as you will see we can uh, really uh, create quite complex pipeline just by a few mouse clicks. It gives us, us access and this is one, one major characteristic and feature of our tools to a very large collection of selected public data. We have up to today more than 400 experiments that correspond to more than 30,000 data samples. So they are we have them as a pre-processed -process, uh, data already in read alignment format, SGA, as I said, that can be browsed, viewed, explored, and, and for teaching purposes, learning purposes, and we can for, uh, co and that can be combined with public data. This is also very important for reproducible resource, because if you want to reproduce a figure in a, in a paper. This is very nice. You have the data already accessible. We provide upload in several formats. Okay, the most common one, BAM, BED, BAM, and SGA, which is our format. And another important feature is the high interoperability. This is one of our guiding uh, principles, being high interoperable with other tools, both from our groups and with external resources. And we will see that in a while. So, so, so this is just an extract from a survey 
that we did when we published our tool uh, that was aimed at comparing similar resources in the field and we focused on resources at that time uh, that were available on the web, uh, such as Nebula, Citron, these are galaxy-based resources mainly, and we're accepting read alignment files in BED and BAM formats, which are the common formats. Here I would like to highlight the performance of our peak caller, uh, which can, uh, okay, this is the performance for scanning the entire genome for peak calling an entire genome. Genome, HG19, the HG9 human genome assembly with, uh, with default settings. And you will see that uh, our uh, chip CP calling takes less than a minute, more than a minute, whereas our tools take 15, uh, several minutes. So this is the, how the chipsec portal looks like. And this is general, uh, we have this more or less the same look uh, for all our interfaces. So from the left side menu, you can access uh, the tools. We also have uh, in the main page, the main frame, we have a brief description of each tool. And here on the left side menu, you can access other tools from our resources, tools and databases, as well as tutorial and documentation. So what we will do today, I will, uh, what, basically this is a flow chart of a typical chip seek analysis and specifically what I will show you today, as I said, we will start from a read alignment file that is already present on our server. So accessible via the menu, the inter menu driven uh, mechanism on the interface. We will do read shifting, pick calling, and once we have our peak list, we will uh, see how to do quality assessment, assessment of our peak list by motif enrichment analysis and explore the genomic context of our IP regions by doing some correlation analysis with histone modification profile. So let's start with read shifting and peak calling. As was already mentioned yesterday, read shifting is typically a pre-processing pre pre step where we basically shift the plus uh, strand forwards toward the center of our uh, bound fragments and the reads on the minus strand, we shift it back, backwards to the center in order to increase the resolution. So we will get basically a read distribution picked at the, at the center, at the protein uh, bind locus, binding locus, basically. We have chip centering or chip C, uh, read shifting as both a standalone application, but this is rarely used or most most used is the input data processing option on our uh, inter web interfaces. So read shifting is illustrated here. If you, remind, if you recall the previous uh, read alignment distribution at the ICAM promoter, the one of the stat one target genes, we had the green uh, uh, reads uh, on the plus strand, the red greens, and the black greens will represent the centered or shifted reads to which coincide with the stat one binding site. So of course, by shifting, we lose the orientation. So reads that are shifted or centered are uh, unstrand unstranded reads. So with peak calling, uh, we, do as a, we do first peak calling. So we want to find how many binding sites and where they are located. So the basic idea of any peak caller program is to identify regions in the genome, in the genome where we find more sequences, sequencing reads than we would expect to see by chance. Okay, our uh, <clears throat> our uh, method, as I said before, implements a very simple method which works as follows. As we show here, we took as input genome wide shifted read distribution for one genomic feature of STAT1 IP data. The output is a, basically a list of peak center position with read counts 
as a matrix for uh, measuring your peak strands. So in, we, in our case, the number of reads in, is counted in sliding window of fixed width. If we fix uh, 300, 200 base pair typically. Speed, uh, we gain speed by considering only those windows that have uh, a, at least one read at the center position. So we shift across the genome. And for each position, for the, each of such windows, we, we uh, determine, we compute the cumulative read counts in these windows and select a speed position the centers of those windows that have a cumulative read count that is greater than a given peak threshold in read count. And in addition, our local maxima within a vicinity range, within a range, basically we merge peak that fall within a given range. Optionally, we can refine these peak center positions. Instead of giving the center of each windows, we will report the arithmetic mean of read position within uh, the peak region so as to give a more precise peak location. So this is the chip, seek, uh, the chip peak input form. I would now like uh, to go on the web uh, page itself so it's better I can show you how to, how to operate. Let me try it <laughs> to do that. So this is the chip peak uh, module, analysis online module. So here, as I said before, you have a, on the right, on the left hand side, you select your data sets. You can upload, it, of course, your own. own, own your own data, or you can select available data sets though that we have pre-processed from publicly available experiments. So in our case, we so you, you can select, we have several genome assemblies, we have data for several genome assemblies and species, more than 15 species. You select data type, That can be, we have several data, chip seek, chip seek peak already pre-processed data, other types of pre-processed data and, and so on, uh, collection from the ENCODE uh, consortium and so on. And then you select your experiment and your sample in particular. So we, we can select that, our, uh, our STAT1 data. So then uh, you, you say that you, uh, this is the pre-processing pre step for uh, read shifting. We choose send, uh, 75 as centering as we have previous, previously estimated by cross-correlation of five prime and three prime tags, uh, as Eric explained yesterday, that our average fragment size is around 150 base pairs. So we shift by 75 base pairs downstream and upstream respectively. So this is the pre-processing step. And here on the right, you have the peak detection parameters. As I said, you define a window width. Here we are using a fixed sized windows. So the vicinity range, which in, uh, typically we set as the windows window width. So we merge or, or local maxima within our uh, within our windows within our region and here you you can set the peak threshold peak threshold can be set in two ways you can uh, uh, you can um, specify re uh, specify it in read counts in absolute read counts and this is of course less intuitive how do you know how many read counts you should uh, accept in order to define your region significant compared to a background mean so we also give uh, a bag background average uh, read density let's say uh, to make this easier for you we you can also uh, select your threshold in relative enrichment factor, so you give a full change with respect to a background uh, read density. So you say 20 times your background read density, or 10 times, or, or and so on. 
So on this you can set, generally you can start with 10, 10 times where this is a typical uh, threshold that maximizes sensitivity for chip seek experiment, but then it depends very much on your read coverage and so on. So, but we will see later how to choose reasonable uh, uh, peak thresholds. So we, we do. Giovanna, can I ask you a question? Sorry to interrupt. Yes, of course. In the additional input data option that you had on the left, uh, you In have this little uh, repeat mask. Uh, if we don't yes. cross, it's mean you map on the repeat. And if you cross, you don't map on the repeat. Is correct exactly. We mask if we cross it. You mask repeat re repeated regions. Yes. If you don't want to mask repeated regions, you want to extract uh, IP regions uh, in uh, non-repeated uh, regions. Let's say and that is boosting a lot the program. I guess. Yeah, you typically you you want to use that for instance if you want to do then motif discovery, binding motif discovery. You want to mask repeated regions because there you might find motifs uh, that are not really the binding motif of your, of your protein. Thanks. So you submit. And hopefully it will take less than a minute, <laughs> as I claimed before. Okay, that was the case, I guess. So here is the chip peak output page. The output page reports the number of peaks that have been identified by chip peak. In our case, uh, 6,500 6, peaks. The, uh, the peak files in several formats, namely BED, SGA file, and other formats that are used for our uh, tools. And then you have links to external tool, uh, tools, great for uh, peak annotation, as we will see in a while, and you CSC browser uh, to view your data on the browser. You can optionally lift over, if you are interested, to other genome assemblies, your pick list to other assemblies, if then you want to compare list or you want to lift over to other assemblies for you. You can extract sequences around your picks. And this is, a, is, a, is it is, for instance, useful if you want to extract sequences around your peaks for subsequent motif discovery, then you can use MIM. I don't know whether you know MIM or other motif discovery tools that you upload your fast A sequences. And then here, uh, most important, you have the links to for downstream analysis, links, direct links, as we will see in a while, to our to our tools for, uh, for motif analysis and genome, co genome context analysis. So let's now look at the UCSC view, just to show how it, how, how it looks. UCSC is a bit slower. No, it was fast enough. Okay, here we are at the ICAM. Yeah, Jean, because I use them, then UCSC used to cache your, <laughs> your operation, so it's good. So this is a stat one peak detected by chip peak in our case. So it, we, we show, uh, at UCSC, we show both the bed, so the region we have. So this is a 300 base pair region, and we show the peak density, the peak height, basically, the peak strength is the height in weak form. So we show both representation, bad and weak, for each region, for each peak. Uh, the bad, as I said, shows the region, uh, the entire region of your peak. The gray shade is uh, uh, correlated with a peak height. The strong, the highest, uh, the, the stronger is the color. And so on, then you can zoom in, of course, zoom out uh, to see more peaks. You can focus on a particular, uh, so here you also has, you also see histone mark, you see, 
you, you see uh, you can switch on uh, chip seq data if you want to compare with other experiment chip seq data from the encode consortium just to see to compare your your data with the public available data and so on as i said before uh, you can uh, okay you can you choose your threshold more or less yeah by uh, attempts so you you start with an enrichment factor is no rich enrichment factor one way to see whether your pick list is reasonable or you to explore the functional uh, let's say the functional uh, meaning of your uh, basically of your uh, ip regions is to annotate them a, a nice tool for doing that is great which is a tool that is used to annotate the cis genomic regulatory regions by using by associate by using nearby annotations go terms annotation of nearby genes so first you associate your regions with nearby genes and further you try to associate uh, your regions with go terms and you of course you assess the uh, go term uh, genomic region association you you can access the significance by binomial by a binomial distribution so to say that these associations are, are not just by chance and you use a binomial model for assessing that so what great does it outputs first of all you have histogram showing basically the genomic compartment the genomic distribution of your region so here you see that Basically, our stat one regions tend to be this, they, they don't tend to be at uh, promoter regions uh, mainly, but they tend to be more distant. So we will see that are basically are enhanced per regions. And here you have what uh, a nice table of uh, go biological uh, terms that are enriched in your uh, peak list. And here you see the terms and are ranked by these binomial, binomial p-values that gives basically the, the, a probability that your association is not just by chance because you have across the genome genes that have this specific annotation and your regions by chance have been associated to these co-terms. You can visualize this, so these are ranked by binomial p-value. This is the matrix that is used by default. You can choose other matrix, binomial for the enrichment, uh, for instance, and the others. And this is the false discovery rate. Basically, these are the adjusted binomial p-values. You can display this uh, this uh, table in bar chart representation as a bar chart again showing the rank the binomial p-value ranking and here you see as you can see that the top rank uh, go terms fun biological terms are related to regular uh, regulation of inflammatory response positive leukocyte differentiation, which is uh, the biological role, basically consistent with the biological role of STAT1. So let me go back to our presentation. So of course, um, so this is what I have been shown now. And this is, if you want, you have it on the slides, but what I said is how great works by predicting functions of cis regulatory region. You have your regions. You first try to associate both proximal and distant your input region with target genes, putative target genes. And then later on to ontology annotation terms, which are uh, depicted here in Big A. And then you will have an association, an enriched of uh, regular uh, of ontology annotations in your uh, uh, in your IP list. 
to assess uh, the significance of this uh, enrichment, you use a binomial probability that basically states, uh, that basically calculates the probability that this association is basically not by chance. So once we have our pick list, we would like to do some quality assessment uh, estimates, because what you would like to do, of course, you, you can vary your threshold, you can do it by, by varying your threshold. Of course, if you have low threshold, you will have many peaks, many false positive. You would like to uh, reduce the number of false positive peak by, by, by not missing too many true binding sites. How do you do that? One way of doing that, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you don't want to give, uh, we don't do statistics on our peak list as, uh, as it is done in Crunch, for instance. You have just a way we give tools to assess that. This is, for instance, a benchmarking of your peak list is to use motif enrichment. Do motif enrichment tests, do, annota uh, do uh, yeah, annotation steps of your peaks to find out whether you pick up interesting uh, biological uh, terms, biological function. So motif enrichment, as it was said before uh, yesterday, uh, the rationals behind that is that your peak, your peak list, if your protein binds directly to DNA, should contain the binding sites for your protein or for your family of transcription factor or other transcription factors. If you, your protein co has uh, cofactors as well, but the rationale is that we should find. Uh, your peak list should be enriched in the binding motif for your protein. How do we do that? How, today I'll show you how to do that using SSA. Of course, there are other tools on the, on the bioinformatics world, <laughs> online world, such as Centrim or Neem as well, which does basically the same thing, similar things. Our SSA tools have been originally developed for analyzing eukaryotic promoters many years ago by Philippe uh, with the purpose of characterizing sequence motifs that occur at specific distances from physiologically defined sites in DNA sequences. I would like to highlight here that we, with these tools, we look for motifs that occur at constraint, at fixed distances uh, from sites, from functional sites, like our, our IP regions in this case, or transcription start site and so on. This is depicted here, where you see, here we have sequences, you can see sequences that are aligned uh, with respect to a functional site, could be a transcription start site or peak centers, peak positions. For, uh, for a chipsick experiment. And here, the type of the kind of motif pattern that we want to study, to try to represent, is uh, try to, yeah, to, to find out, is represented by these red boxes, green and blue, uh, here in the figure. So the, this type of pattern, we call it uh, technically locally overrepresented sequence motifs. How, this is uh, the SSA web interface. As you said, the lo it looks like the <laughs> very much the ChIP-seq uh, web interface. On the left side, you, you have access to your tools, to, to documentation. You have a brief description of each tool from the, uh, from the server, from the platform. Today, now we will use uh, OPROF, uh, which stands for Motif Occurrence Profile, for finding, uh, for doing our motif enrichment analysis. How does OPROF work? OPROF uses a, uh, yeah, uh, uses as the input a functional position set, a file that tells you basically that position your peaks, uh, that has the position of your peaks or of your feature of interest and extract sequences around these peaks 
it takes as input also the a sequence motif, a motif binding side that can be described as a consensus sequence or as a position scoring matrices. On the web, we offer uh, models from many uh, motif collections, such as Hokomoko, as it was uh, mentioned yesterday, Swiss Regulon as well, and uh, Jasper. Well, these are a few of the most common uh, motif collections. So once we have that, the binding motif and the set of DNA sequences are, uh, that are aligned with respect to your peaks. So peak sequences, basically, DNA sequences around your peak regions. You scan these sequences in a sliding window to find motif occurrences at each position across, uh, across your sequence. The output is a graph that shows the occurrence frequency of your signal as a function of its position relative to, to, the, fun, uh, to the functional side, the peak center, for instance. So how do you do that? Uh, I'll go back to the web uh, interface. I'll have to close some windows. Okay, so here we are at the output page uh, from, uh, from uh, Chipik. So here I said we have links to downstream analysis. Here you have a direct link, what I call direct navigation link to the OPROS. So you will be presented by, by the OPROF page, input page. And the input page will have already your data set uploaded, so you don't need to do anything with your data set. This is your pick list. We will just have eventually to adjust the uh, uh, parameters for the analysis. So here you have the regions. You want to explore the region minus five plus 500k, 500 base pairs around your uh, peak size, the window size, as I said, you slide, you use a windows to, to find your currents of your binding motif, the window shift by, by direction. You can optionally switch on the, the shuffling sequences just to see your background, just to compare with your background. As I said, you can, use a consensus sequence for your motif. Which is the consensus sequence for, for the stat one binding side, but you can use motif uh, position scoring matrices for defining, for describing your motif, and you can pick this up from uh, motif collections. So if we use the consensus to be you submit. And so here you are screening your, uh, your sequences around your peak regions, your IP sequences for stat one for finding the binding site. And here, as you said, as you see, you see a peak at the center position, meaning that basically you, your binding motif falls in the center position of your region. You have an enrichment of 40%, a frequency of 40%, which means that approximately 40% of your peak regions have the binding motif for, for stat one. And this is if you shuffle, this is the background distribution. As I said before, uh, you have you can pick up your motif from uh, different uh, motif libraries. We have Jasper, we have Hokomoko, we have Swiss Regulum uh, that Eric mentioned yesterday, and others for uh, also for other species. We have Drosophila motifs, Arabidopsis motifs, and others. So you can do that, of course, with. Uh, with several thresholds, of course, just to assess uh, different uh, peak thresholds. 
using the same strategy, the same strategy. Okay, this is what we have seen. And so you will get, you will see that different peak lists different, from different thresholds will end up with different enrichment, of course. And as expected, the peak height is inversely correlated to the number of peaks, so meaning uh, more peaks, less peaks, uh, the more stringent you are, the higher is the enrichment for your binding site. So let's now study, try to explore the genomic context of our IP regions, that one peak regions. How do we do that? What, what does it mean? Generally, what by exploring the genomic concept, we want to see whether regions fall preferentially in uh, transcriptions, in uh, promoter regions or enhancer regions or, and so on, or it's a repressive mark, which kind of transcriptional activity your protein has. So how do you do that? A way of doing that using our tool is to uh, to use a correlate another tool, chip core, to correlate your uh, your regions of interest that we call reference uh, or anchor regions or functional region with other uh, with other profiles with other target features. Today we choose, of course, histone modifications. So we will choose three types of histone modification. H3K27 acetylation, which means acetylation of lysine 27 for histone 3, which is a typical uh, active enhancer mark. It marks, it marks for active uh, enhancer, enhancer regions. H3K4 trimethylation, which is an active promoter mark. And H3K27 trimethylation, which is a typical repress, uh, repressive mark. For as uh, target features, for uh, we chose our histone modification profiles from an encode experiment targeted at histone modification in several cell lines and in particular HeLa cells, but that are not the zone uh, interferon gamma stimulated. So let me now introduce the second tool uh, from ChIPSEC the chip core correlation tool. These tools is very useful. We can do that for several purposes, for quality control of our data. And it's uh, more uh, very often a prior step for doing this cross correlation analysis between uh, five prime and three prime n tags so to estimate uh, the average fragment size. You can do that prior to doing uh, uh, peak calling. And so to better choose your, uh, you, you can also see, uh, you can also estimate signal to noise ratio by looking at this, uh, the, uh, the distribution, uh, the read density distribution across the entire genome. But you can also, you, and you can use it to generate nice aggregation plots. Aggregation plots is a technical term that means that an aggregation Aggregation plot shows basically the distribution of a particular genomic feature today, for instance, here, histone modification relative to a specific anchor point that can be your peak regions again, or a transcription start site or other set of uh, genomic regions of interest. You want to correlate positionally two features basically. So here uh, I will uh, explain here by showing you how to build this aggregation plot by exemplifying with a few examples. So you, you have here, you have your genome, your human genome, you have your chromosome. The reference feature, i.e. your peaks, are these vertical red lines, whereas the target features are the orange boxes. So here you have your, uh, your two features depicted here. You define the correlation distance, a region uh, around that you want to study around each reference point. And so you proceed. So I will exemplify for four regions, but this will uh, be done across the entire, uh, in the entire genome. So first uh, region you see does not contribute to the aggregation plot. We don't have any target feature around. 
second region, you will get a box account here at this specific position and so on. Uh, region third and four will contribute to this uh, part of the plot and so on and you will end up with a nice uh, aggregation plot that tells you basically represent the abundance of your target feature relative to your reference anchor feature, reference feature. Again, let's use uh, chip core directly on the web, starting again from our pick list. Pick list output. Okay, we go back to, we can, uh, we can increase, of course, the number of peaks so by changing. The relative enrichment factor, as I said before, in this case, of course, we will obtain more peaks. And we can do that, as I said, you can really, we encourage you to explore, to interact with the web, to explore, uh, for exploring your data, comparing with other data, using uh, other tools and so on. This is the idea that you really explore your data and this can be done with a few mouse clicks. So here we said we want to study histone profiles around your pics. You go to chip core. Again, you are presented with a chip core interface. On the left side, you have your data set already uploaded to the page. Here you have your analysis parameters, typical for chip core. You will have to define the correl your correlation uh, distance, your correlation region. Since histones are rather spread, uh, spread signal, we can choose a larger regions than the default that is plus minus one KB here plus minus five KB the window width that we can increase just for speed the count cutoff I haven't commented on the count cutoff this is a generally set to one you know you remember the SGA that has counts uh, that has counts as a fifth field that represents the how many reads the number of reads that have been mapped to the to this particular uh, genomic location. Generally, we tend to set a cutoff to one, so we keep each read once, uh, you no, know, at each position, and we want to avoid. Uh, yeah, we want to filter out regions where you get for as um, Eric mentioned yesterday. Uh, for PCR or any technical artifacts, you have regions that really attracts. Seven, several thousands of reads. So you want to avoid that. So you always uh, set a count cutoff that can be one, 10, it's not necessarily one. And here also you have normalization. So you generally, when you scan, uh, as you said, your target feature around your reference in uh, reference feature regions, you just count the number of counts. You can show the results in row counts, or you can show the results in read density density, or as a global, as a fold enrichment compared to a, again to a to a background level uh, density level. So here we choose the global visualization, and here you select your target feature. So you have here you have two two windows, two, yeah, two menus for your reference, where you define your reference feature and your target feature. Again, the genome assembly has to be the same. You cannot mix up different assembly. You select encode the chip seek this time, the data set, because we said that we are, want to analyze data, histone data from encode. Histone modification, this is the set. Here you scroll, you see you have several sets and you choose, as we said, the acetylation mark, for instance, to begin with. And here you shift by 70 and you, you submit. This will take 
a bit longer because it's a large file. We are dealing with large file, but not much longer. Why did I choose 70 as a shifting? Uh, because histone modifications are, yeah, uh, IP, for instance, modification uh, brings down, basically pulls out DNA fragments that are wrapped around nucleosomes. And these are typically 140, 150 base, base, pair, base pair in length. That's the, one of the main reason that we can choose that. So typically, yeah, you have centering shifting distances that are, that you can, uh, yeah, choose as default. It was quite fast. So how, here you get your uh, histone, histone profile for H3K27 acetylation around around stat one peak region so what what can you infer from that your stat your stat one peak regions which are more or less 500 base pairs regions more or less have yeah unenriched in h3k4 acetylation marks that are flanked by these nucleosomes carrying this histone modification you see a valley at the middle of your peak which makes sense because probably this is a nucleosome free region given that the protein the stat one protein is bound so you it evicts a nucleosome and here you see more or less compared to background if you think yeah uh, seven fold enrichment in this histone modification mark you can do exactly the same with H3, as I said, K4 ME3, which is the typical promoter mark, active mark. So this is nice. This is uh, what chip core does is this aggregation plot. Of course, this is a, a profile for your histone that is average across the entire genome. So you will see an average profile. Not every site, of course, will have the same uh, nucleosome organization. But this is because we scan the, the entire genome, we create this aggregation plot. This is an average profile. And this is the profile for H3K4 ME3. Here you see we have a, um, the, the enrichment fold, it's much less, it's 4, 3 or 4. Compared to that, the shape is basically the same, meaning that you always have this valley at the, uh, where the protein, where the stat1 protein is bound, most likely at the peak center, and you have enriched somewhat kind of enrichment for H3K4 ME3. And you do that to see it with the repressive mark. If we have it here, we don't have it now, but I did it some time ago, so I will show you the plot on my slides. So if we go back. So this is what we have just seen before. So if you do it for the repressive mark, you will see basically a flat line, which means, as I said, that uh, this, this, this result suggests that STAT1 primarily binds to region, first of all, that are already in an active chromatin state, because here, remember, we are looking at HeLa cells that are not stimulated. So it looks like the, the binding sites are already in, a, in an active chromatin state, binds primarily to enhancer regions, primarily, but to a certain extent also to, to promote a region, but to a less extent. And you have this typical valley at position zero. You can also ask from the same, uh, exploiting the same type of data, are this region also acting in other cell lines? 
And for that, using the same procedure, I will not go back, uh, you, but you can do it yourself. Picking up other cell lines, we chose uh, for our tutorial three other cell lines, so the embryonic stem cell and the embryonic stem cell, the lymphoblastoid cell line, the GM12 8 and the cancer-derived cell line, K562. And as you can see from these uh, histone profiles for the acetylation mark, there is a substantial degree of tissue specificity, meaning that not all tissues are in the same chromatin state as the HeLa cells. So I said before that with a chip core, we have, we get an aggregation profile, a profile for your histone marks, for histone, or for your target feature more generally, that it's averaged across the entire genome because you repeat that, you report that for all the regions uh, in your genome and you get a profile. If you want to have a, uh, a different picture in a sense and you want to see maybe patterns, specific patterns, subset of regions that behave different, that have different patterns, you will use the chip extract tool that does uh, uh, similar things as the chip, uh, chip core tool, is a correlation tool, so it scans reference feature regions for a target feature, for the abundance of target feature, but instead of plotting uh, an aggregation plot, it, it gives you the results in a tabular form for each, in a tabular form for each reference feature, and I will show you that. So uh, this table, this tabular form represents, has rows, uh, rows that represent each reference anchor point, uh, each of these regions, and columns, the feature read counts or, or, or occurrences, depending on, uh, again, on the type of normalization that you choose, at specific distances relative to your reference feature. So what it will do is, it, I will exemplify it again with these uh, few regions. So this is for feature at, at this position for reference feature, you will get this line representing target feature abundance or read counts across this correlation region. Same thing with this, you have the target feature here, so you have reads at this position, basically. And here as well, you have this and so on. And you will get a uh, this tabular table output that can be easily represented in R as a heat map. And as you can see already from here, the heat map gives you an idea of the proportion of regions. These are regions, for instance, your reference regions, the heat map can be ranked. And these are regions that are ranked according to the similarity to the overall pattern, the aggregation profile. This is the aggregation profile that you will get with the chip core analysis. And this is the proportion of regions that has basically that reports this type of pattern that uh, have similar pattern you will see that you have regions that do not have at all this type of patterns or or even the opposite or other type of patterns but overall the majority has this type of course you can okay when you when you create this table you can be in uh, the way you report or the, your uh, target feature abundance. So you can bin your results, your read counts. You can use different binning size and this will produce, of course, as we can see here, smoother pictures, but the, the idea is always the same. So let's now use chip core, chip, sorry, chip extract on the web. Again, using our histone marks. So we go back to the output, ship pick output page, and we can go to chip extract, similarly to what we have done before for chip core, same thing. Uh, we are presented with a chip extract input page module. 
with already the data, uh, the data upload on the page. Again, uh, we, you choose your analysis parameter. And again, here we can increase the correlation distances. Your binning size. And here you select again, as before, your target data set from the ENCODE Gypsy collection, histone modifications. H3K acetylation mark, you again center. And here you have a few option for ordering your heat map. Uh, you produce this table and you represent it as a heat map, resemble to overall pattern, as I've mentioned before. So you ranked your regions, your peak regions, uh, based on their similarity to the overall pattern. You can use other matrix center of gravity, basically to see whether you have maybe symmetric if you tend to have path, specific patterns that are asymmetric uh, maybe from left to right for instance or you can also use k-mean uh, clustering to cluster your peak regions according to your uh, to your target feature profile so we use the default And this is, as I said, very useful because it gives you a more in-depth yeah, idea on how your, of the, on how your yeah, uh, IP regions are characterized, the heterogeneity, if you like, of your data. You want to dig in. And then if you use clustering, you can select subset of regions that maybe have this type of histone mark, histone profile. So they are regions that maybe that are probably located in enhancers region from those that are located in, uh, in promoter regions and so on. And then do downstream analysis, pick motifs, compare with uh, if you extract regions uh, around promoter regions, you can correlate with transcriptional start sites to see, to study dynamics of your peak. So this is the picture for, uh, for H3K4 ME3. So you see there is a substantial fraction of peaks that have H that are marked by the acetylation mark. And this is, exa is exactly the picture, the aggregation plot that we saw on chip core. And if now you, you can, of course, uh, repeat the, th uh, the same exercise with the uh, HPK4 histone mark. And if you do that, I will show you already the results. Basically, you have, yeah, you have this picture where you see that the proportion of peaks that have uh, H H3K twenty seven acetylation marks are larger compared to the K four trimethylation mark, the promoter mark, basically consistent with what we have seen before, and with that. I would like to end this presentation. So here I would like to first acknowledge uh, the group, our group. Okay, Philip for the nice discussion, uh, his guidelines and his patience. <laughs> Rene and Ruida who are former collaboration and Rene, especially Rene, who left the group two years ago and who implemented a great deal of the MGA data repository, the curation uh, data, the public data sets uh, repository, and Ruida for managing the, co the quality control of our web pages. Very important as well. And last but not least, thank you very much for your attention. And now, please don't hesitate to ask questions.